So I learned about this car from my wife's coworker. She is a teacher um, here in Ohio. So her dad unfortunately passed away and he um, was a caretaker of this car, I believe. I'm trying to think. Um, I believe it's in late 90s he's had this car for and um, just kind of started, you know, going downhill and everything. And it just sat in uh, the garage until his unfortunate passing. She asked if, you know, I wanted to take a look at it because she knew I had a YouTube channel and liked this kind of thing and turned out to be a 70 Chevelle. So I definitely was obviously interested in going to look at the car. Now everything went super smooth in terms of starting the car. It was sitting for years. Um, I believe the uh, owner of the garage, since it wasn't this um, Lance co-worker's father's garage, it was someone else's that was nice enough to house this car. I think someone was starting this up every now and then, so it, it's been sitting a while, but luckily the battery was actually fresh enough to turn it over. And once it got fuel to the carburetor, um, this Quadrajet actually fired right up, idled perfect, and the engine actually is pretty strong. So um, other than the gears, you know, not really wanting to go on this automatic transmission, it was pretty simple to load it up and everything. But the main issue, and this happened over multiple days, was trying to get the car to a VIN inspection, meaning the state, state Highway Patrol's office, because we were looking at the VIN and the same thing happened with two other cars I bought in the past, a couple years ago, the Camaro and the Jaguar. So um, there was one digit off on the VIN. So I want to make sure that that was legit and just probably an error typo down the line. Someone made a mistake, but it turned into a complete nightmare trying to get this car to okay. State Highway Patrol's um, office out there. The first time I loaded the car up, um, ran to the U-Haul, went down. We ended up blowing a tire on the way there on the U-Haul trailer, which has never happened to me before. So we missed the time to have the car there at the State Highway Patrol's office, and they were really strict. And if you were more than five minutes late, they don't accept anyone. So that was out. We had to reschedule a month down the road. Okay, I'll try to start it. I want to make sure that... It I don't have any gauges, you know, to monitor, even if it's going to be a couple minutes, but <laughs> I should have brought some water. Yeah. I don't think so. Uh, turn that light on. We'll grab that light and shine it in there.
this way, Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Come on. So here's the original vent right here. This five, now they scraped this off because this was covered. So this five, they put as a four. So I don't know if the windshield was ever replaced at one point, but this goopy stuff here that held the window in, um, they put a little bit too much glue on here and it covered the, the vent. So um, apparently this person just guessed on the uh, DMV wherever you know register the car um, that verified the vent originally they guessed and put a four instead of a five so unfortunately for that that means they have to at least have two other areas on the car that they can pull a number from that will match that that doesn't look suspicious of any fraudulent activity meaning stolen the car um, in this past and i don't think anyone would mess with this car it's pretty original looking so um but anyway i wanted to get this car verified make sure it was done right and had the title corrected getting to the state highway patrol's office the second time to um, verify this VIN. Um, they pulled it in everything fine and started looking at it. Couldn't find a number to verify. Um, the VIN was legit. So they looked on the frame, they said. Then they looked on the firewall. Um, they couldn't find anything. And on the Camaro, I know there's hidden VIN underneath the heater, um, the firewall heater core area. You take the fan off um, for the heater core, heater fan. And then it's right under there stamped on the other side of that. Well, at least it should be. Now this one, this car, is a air conditioned car. So it has a different setup than my Camaro, which was non-AC. It has this huge air conditioned box over here. Looks like that. And it's a huge pain to get off. So, um, they pretty much said that they don't have any more time to work on it that day and to come back another time and make another appointment. Well, I, I'm not gonna do that and run a U-Haul trailer a third time before I purchased the car. Um, I was doing this all before paying for the car because I wanted to know everything was correct on here and, and good before I spent money on buying it. So um, they said pretty much, well, you can go outside and work on it on your own. So I'm out here in about 95 degree weather and working on this car on top of a U-Haul trailer with my dad and um, Matt um, was there too, which was the son-in-law to 
um, this previous owner here. So we're out there trying to get this thing apart and I was so fed up that I was like, you know what, um, we'll just take the, the heater core out and I'm gonna get this done today. So I'm out there struggling, trying to get all filthy and you know, hot, trying to get this heater core out in the middle of um, summer and uh, with bare minimum tools, they, I luckily I brought my own set of tools because I knew something was gonna happen or something was gonna, you know, we're gonna need it for something. So just judging how the way the first trip went of the tire blowout and trying to get rescheduled and all this stuff, it was just, for some reason, this car was fighting me, trying to get um, the ownership changed under my name and having it verified. So I ended up meeting a, one of the officers there was in the Chevelles and he ended up being higher up, um, luckily there. And he just was looking while we're out there frantically trying to tear everything apart. So he called in a specialist to come down, look at the car and try to help us out. So that was after I removed everything and this is the aftermath of me ripping into the car. I ripped this whole thing out here, it's fiberglass, but I know I'm gonna be not using this because of vintage air, long story short, so I don't, I'm not gonna use that anymore. It's not an SS car, so I'm not worried about trying to ruin um, or ruining anything that's you know super valuable on here. So I ended up having to just rip into this inner fender well, um, reach up in here, and then um, get the bolts and rip the rest of it out, all for these three little digits right here. So the um, specialist was using some sort of special like liquid stuff that um, didn't mess with anything, but you know kept the numbers intact. I read off the VIN to him and he said it's good. So that was the whole thing in a nutshell right there, but it was super stressful and I'm glad it's over with. Cars transferred my name now and the VIN is verified and changed to the correct number. So just something to think about when you guys are buying older cars. I know to look for this thing now because of the first two cars I purchased, I already paid for them and um, that issue happened after I paid for them. So I just wanna make sure that this was completely fine before paying for it, just in case something did happen, which it's a pretty common thing, at least it seems like in Ohio now that um, for older cars that people change the VINs by accident when they're changing titles or ownerships or whatever. So just um, some food for thought for you guys to look into when you're buying older cars to look at. That's about as far as it's gonna go. Come on, stupid thing. There's, there's just not enough room to do it. Um, I'm getting this out. That's the only thing we gotta do. We gotta take the heater thing out. Well, I realized I was talking to myself just about a minute ago for this whole next spiel I was gonna give you guys about the trunk. So um, I'll leave some things and I'll start it again. But pretty much what I just did now for the first time was remove the um, spare wheel well and checked out what was in the trunk, showing you guys what was underneath. And it was all crusty, pretty much it had a bunch of random rags, cleaning rags, old sock. Um, and I was saying a lot of cars, you could tell a history of what the issue was by looking in the trunk. This one was, um, you know, no exception. Had some automatic transmission fluid, power steering stop leak, and 50-50 antifreeze on here. And I know that we had a leak a little bit. It won't go beyond about halfway full for the radiator. You can see some right brazing and stuff that People were trying to fill um, in there to try to get it to stop leaking, not a big deal. And you can also see that power steering is definitely saturated on there. So he must have some sort of issue with either the rack or the pump itself. Um, I know that just driving up and down the driveway and off the trailer, it actually is very easy to steer. And this car is a big car. If you haven't seen one of these in person, I mean, my garage, it makes my garage look pretty tiny. So it's, it's a big car, but it's easy to drive because the power steering is actually super nice on it. The other thing was um, the gears are definitely lazy, as I was mentioning earlier. 
I can only go into low and then once I get the fluid circulating or whatever, it starts to you know, free up a little bit more and get going and I can put it in normal drive. And then eventually after 10 or 15 minutes, it'll go in reverse and I'll be able to get reverse, but that's not a huge deal either. And I'll tell you why here in a couple minutes, but um, looking at the other pan and everything, there's no really rot through besides right here. Let's see right there, but that's not a huge deal. I love this car because everything is fairly reasonably priced for patch panels and I don't have to make a lot of stuff myself. So I can just, you know, time versus cost, it's easier just to buy this pre-made, put it in, drop the fuel tank, and then be done with it and make it all brand new. And another thing I was asking you guys before my camera cut out was, see how that's kind of bent up like that? It's not connected to the side at all here. So right here, like there's, there's no, nothing connecting that. I don't know if that's factory or not. The other side's not like that, but I don't see any issue of it being hit or anything from the back. You know, too hard or anything like that. Everything looks straight, except for the bumper is pressed in a little bit right here compared to the gap down here. And I think that's just due to the fact that um, he must have backed into something. This, this bumper is pretty heavy duty and did put some dents in it like that, I'm sure. It probably pushed this in a little bit. This panel is kind of warped a little bit when you close it. Um, so when you shut it, you can see here it lines up really nice. Then this overhangs too much, real bad right there, and then gets normal about right there. It starts coming back out and it comes out real bad right here. The only visible rust I can see on the body, which I will address eventually too. Right here, it looks worse than it actually is. It's just the paint's bubbling off and I'm sure there's probably some rot in here, but it's real sturdy. Um, you know, nothing's gonna fall off or anything, but. Going over, over the original color of this car, it was a maroon with a black vinyl top. At least it you know, was from the factory. Currently, obviously it's some sort of blue slash green with a white painted top. Uh, paint job, well, you know, obviously it wasn't that good or anything, but it is there and I will be doing a detailed video on this. So just to see what I'm working with and just to have a little bit of fun because that's how I started out with the Camaro before I went course crazy and restored the whole thing of the Camaro. So you can see, where is it? There's some red right under there. You can see this is the factory color. Um, chipping off a little bit right here too. This was maroon too, but other than that, good starting point. Now I haven't decoded the engine or anything, but this is a supposed to be a 350. Um, at least that's what it says on the badges. And I'll tell you the trim code numbers here. Let me zoom in on it. So if you guys want to have fun and decode this, you can, but um, I'll probably just put a picture up right now just to make sure that you, know, you guys can read it a little bit easier than it looks right now, but I don't know if I can tell or not on here if this is the original factory numbers matching engine. The um, owner's daughter didn't, wasn't sure um, of that and it wasn't a huge deal on, on it for me. It wasn't a deal breaker because I am eventually going to be changing all this out and doing what I want to this car. Which brings me to my next major point. Now, this isn't a Chevelle SS or anything like that. It's a Chevelle Malibu. It's a very good starting point, great body style. And um, I think it's a very good base to do a rest of mod on. I I have a hard, very hard time if, um, you know, high option car or something or something like the Camaro, like the Z28 and everything, if it's numbers matching, I don't want to rip that apart and do that. But for this, um, I've always wanted to do a rest of mod car and do it how I want kind of express what I want to do with it. Um, you know, do a nice finished panel on the whole engine bay and put the color like I want it and everything. Keep the same Malibu badging and everything and just kind of make it a nice strong driver pretty much. And what I'm going to do, I know this is probably going to get some flack for this, but I want an LS car and I've always wanted an LS3 car, old car. And this is the one that is going to be perfect candidate to do that to. 
Now, I always made fun of people, too, that swapped LS and did all this stuff for LS and their older cars and stuff. But deep down, you just know you want an LS car. It's, just, it's something if you don't have, then you always kind of want before all this electric crap takes over and everything. So I want to have that done. I want to get an LS3. And I know of one that John from the Corvette video, he's looking to um, potentially sell his Tremec 6060, I think it's called, six speed, which he upgraded all of that to hold a lot of horsepower. And he has a LS3 out of a um, late Camaro that he only has 11 or 12,000 miles on, has all the ECU engine holly management and everything, aftermarket stuff, the right oil pan, accessory drives, everything for it. So. Um, he was originally going to use that on a different car that he wanted an old Impala and um, he had a nice frame for that and everything too. But since getting the vet, he's fallen in love with that a little bit more than to want to keep that and pursue his dream of building a Impala, which he already has that Biscayne and you know, that's a very nice car too. So that's the same. It's a very similar platform with some minor differences on there and stuff he was telling me about. So I think that's what he wants to do and what I want to do. Um, so I'm, before I do any of that, I have so many projects going on. I want to keep this car as it is now by the engine transmission. And then, um, I'll be able to, you know, work on this after I get some stuff caught up, what I need to do on the other projects get this 240Z, all the metal work and stuff, get that all done finally. And, um, start to at least get this as a roller and everything, get the fenders all on and epoxy prime it and all that stuff. And then the plan is for this, buff it down, get it nice and detailed, and just drive it as is, enjoy it for what it is, and then a couple years from now, I'll have a nice power plant to uh, just drop right in here, modify. I know the floors have a little bit of rot on them in this section here, um, right around this area. So I'm gonna have to be doing a little bit of floor work too. That's other than that, I can't find anything else wrong with it besides, you know, those patches in the trunk and around this rear window area here. But I'll have to modify the transmission tunnel and stuff anyway. I think it'd be pretty cool to keep the bench seat if I can, but I don't know if that's going to interfere with the six-speed manual. And then, of course, I'll have to figure out all the uh, pedal box assembly and stuff too, um, since this was an automatic or is an automatic car currently right now. So... That's my plan. So let me know if you guys had this car, what you would do. I'm just curious, you know, I'm not gonna change my mind per se, but um, I just would like to know what you guys, if you had a starting point like this as a Chevelle Malibu 70, a very good starting point with the body and, and everything like that. Potentially numbers matching 350 and in the current shape, what would you do with it? Let me know in the comment section below. Again, I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, please like, share, subscribe if you haven't already. It really does help me out and keep me motivated to pursuing these car um, projects. And uh, I'll see you guys in the next one. Have a good Thanksgiving, by the way.